Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, over the weekend, I was mesmerized by some of the salad imagery that was captured by Ghost 16. This was Sunday now into the overnight hours here into the early morning here on Labor Day. And the extent of the fires in the western United States was just incredible to say the least. I'll pause it right here as the sun was setting and you can see the smoke from the fires in California up in the Cascades and Northern Rockies and also in the Central Rockies here spreading smoke into the Central Plains as well. Let's take a look here in the Pacific Northwest first and just watch the smoke. You can see it coming up out of California. Let's pause it right there. Out of California but we also have fires that are in the Cascades, also in Oregon and in the Northern Rockies. And as you watch that animation, again, let me just pull it back here and you can see, look at the extent of the smoke of this fire coming out of Central California. As California was smashing records yesterday in terms of high temperatures, these fires were plaguing us with horrible air quality. But before I go too much farther, I would like to take you right here to this fire, the Cameron Peak Fire in Colorado. I'll give you a zoomed in view of that. Here we can see as the sun was rising on Sunday here, the true extent of that fire in the afternoon as the sun set, the infrared satellite here was still picking up on the heat signature from that fire. There was a pretty amazing video that surfaced last night of this smoke plume as you see it here. And I want to show you that video shot by James, uh, excuse me, Jason Block. He sent this to the National Weather Service at Boulder, which is why we're showing it. It's the Cameron Peak fire as viewed here from, from the air. And you can see the extent of the smoke, first of all, but also look at the pyrocumulus forming on top of this. This fire situation in the western United States is dire, to say the least. And we need to see how things are going to be evolving in the upcoming pattern because take a look at this next animation. You see, this is vertically integrated smoke. And as I play this forward, as you watch the smoke spread here out of the west, there's actually quite a bit going on here that tells me what the upper level flow pattern of the atmosphere is doing. And that is the development of a very, very deep trough that's going to settle over parts of the four corner states in Nevada. And what it's going to do is it's, it's not going to shut down the fire threat. We're going to continue with high fire threat because of strong winds. But look at it spreading its smoke around the base of this deep trough. The question is, where is that trough going and how long is it going to sit here before it begins to move? Let's get to answering those questions. First, I want to show you the European model forecast for the position of that trough as we work through the beginning of this weekend. I've just paused it here Wednesday afternoon. Now, as you look at this, I want to make a quick statement. Last week, we noticed that the two models, the European and the GFS, had different solutions for this week on where that trough was going to be. Well, I said the European was cutting off an upper level trough to sit here over the four corner states. The GFS swept the trough through as one kind of united trough out of the Canadian prairies and took it to the northeast quickly. Well, it turns out the European model had the better solution for this. And this highly amplified omega pattern, as you can see here, is one that is quite amplified. And what I mean by that, if I just step you back, I'm just going to put this right here. This will be midnight, uh, Tuesday into Wednesday morning. And what's color coded for you here is height anomalies, but expressed in terms of standard deviation. Now, why I'm showing you that is because I was curious when you compare this to, to normal, how far away from the mean this was. We can see that the ridge that's in British Columbia here is about three standard deviations above the mean. And the trough that is cutting into parts of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and down into Arizona is almost four standard deviations away from the mean. So this is a highly anomalous event, and it is very amplified in terms of this trough ridge pattern. Now, where it goes from here, Wednesday through the weekend, it's going to be a slow progression getting this trough to exit. I'm just kind of going back and forth here. And as a result, we're going to be seeing multiple days here of very adverse weather across the United States. And it's because of this. You see, as the upper level ridge breaks over the top of the high pressure cell that's sitting off the West Coast, I'm talking about this right here, it then cuts into a positively tilted trough. And as this jet streak comes around the base of it here, two things are going to happen. First, we're going to get outstanding upper level support in through this area for the development of a surface low. Why? There's difluence there, also upper level divergence in this area coming from the lead trough that's the one, excuse me, the deep trough that's the one back there at the west. And then this right here, this jet streak, if I divide that up, we have good upper level support in the right entrance of that jet streak for continued upper level divergence or support in the flow of the atmosphere here. Now, if I take that back off, what I want you to then see is that these winds are going to pinch off right here and cut this low off and leave it lingering in this area. 
Those are the two things I want you to see. Now, when I talk about all this upper level support, I'm talking about getting air to rise. And in the low levels, there's going to be good support for that as well. Again, tomorrow, you can see right here the center of the low and the front that's extending out to the east of it great moisture transport from the south that's going to run up over this front and get pulled to the back side. In fact, there is really strong difluence in this flow all along that front. So that will be the corridor, if I just kind of highlight this again, over which I'm anticipating the heaviest rainfalls in the coming days. And that's also going to be the trajectory of the trough once it finally moves. For those of you in the west, even though cooler weather is coming in, it's going to be very windy, as you can see here. And this is what's going to continue to keep our fire threat very high. Things will be stagnant here over parts of the Mid-South, extending into the Ohio River Valley and into the Southeast. But we will see scattered convection here over Florida, Coastal Carolinas, that region. Okay, that's the setup. Let's now get into some of the details. This is the 4 a.m. update here from all the uh, National Weather Service All Hazards Weather Map. We have high wind warnings, red flag warnings, excessive heat warnings in the west. We have the winter weather advisory on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And you can see that extends all the way down through parts of Wyoming into Colorado where there's a winter storm watch. We still have our high wind watches that are down here in parts of New Mexico. Meanwhile, come up here to the first freeze warnings, frost advisories and freeze watches that are out for the Dakotas and Minnesota. I do expect that to extend down the high plains in the coming days. And also winds over uh, Lake Michigan give us a lake flood advisory in that area. So there's a lot going on and this map is going to become quite a bit more colorful over the coming days. Now leading up to this, we had some precipitation over the weekend, including a large squall line complex that moved out of parts of Minnesota through Iowa, southern Wisconsin, Illinois. Early this morning, the storms were still going here in parts of Michigan, Ohio, getting into Lake Erie, that region. Over the weekend, scattered storms in Texas, also in Florida, and we can see early this morning some of the rain coming in here into parts of Montana. So to look at this, I'm going to show you two different views from the high-resolution NAM model. We're going to stop it right there because this is 6 a.m. this morning. So here's our two uh, large areas of precip. One is the lead front right in through here, cutting in, bringing in some thunderstorms into early morning hours and through this area. But here's the deeper trough on the back side. As we play this forward throughout the day on Monday, this is now Monday afternoon, getting into Monday evening, and into the overnight hours, okay? We will be watching in through this area for some scattered storms to remain through parts of southern Iowa, through central Illinois, over into central Indiana, and this part of Ohio. But the main precipitation band will be back here from Wyoming, where it will be snowing, cutting through South Dakota over toward Minnesota. This is Monday night. As we then work our way into Tuesday morning, this is 6 a.m., getting into mid-morning on Tuesday in the Tuesday afternoon. Remember the area over which we saw that frontal boundary extending, that large area uh, where we saw the, the, the contracting axis right here? Uh, that is gonna be the area that I'm gonna be watching for deformation in the atmosphere and our best upper level support. On the backside, cold enough for snow. To show you this, let's now use a different view of the NAM and watch this in terms of precipitation type. So here we go, this is now early this morning midday today into the afternoon hours there's our storms popping out ahead of it but look at the snow moving through parts of wyoming as this low slides tomorrow this is 6 a.m tomorrow central time getting to noon tomorrow and then finally into the evening hours we'll see storms out ahead of it down here in texas oklahoma and what i'm concerned about as the low develops here is we'll get upslope flow which means we'll get some winds out of the east curling around the the low pressure center and that could extend our snow out here into parts of western nebraska eastern oklahoma excuse me excuse me eastern colorado and then of course running up here over the rocky mountains as we let this go into the overnight hours on Tuesday and into Wednesday morning, the trick will be to know the type of precipitation right in through here, where we could get a mixture of sleet and grapple, but also coming in with some snow. This will be a very, very challenging forecast we're going to watch through the middle of the week before the trough even leaves and goes towards the Great Lakes. So to analyze this, let's talk temperatures first. Monday's high temperatures, let's play this forward. As we get into Tuesday, we can see the depth of that cold giving us a lot of temperatures here that are going to be down here. Well, we're off my color bar, by the way, so maybe more than 40 degrees colder than normal. And right down here, we're going to be seeing temperatures that will be hitting, well, the low 30s and a freeze event. Middle of the day. Wednesday. That's probably the greatest extent of the coldest air on Wednesday. As we play into Thursday and then into Friday, 
Saturday and Sunday as the trough exits, then we'll start to get a rebound in temperatures. But how cold will it be in the mornings? Well, this is Monday morning. This morning, we've already got the 40s in place here. Much warmer in through this area where the warm air is still advecting. Let's now see a snapshot of Tuesday morning. I put a white line on this to denote where we have freezing temperatures. So you get to the west of that. Here in the high plains, the western Dakotas into Montana, we do have freezing temperatures. From there, let's go into Wednesday morning. This might be the greatest extent of the sub-freezing air getting into parts of the, well, much of North Dakota, northern Minnesota. But then as you see here into this part of, of South Dakota, Nebraska, almost all all of Colorado and possibly extending down here into the panhandles. We could possibly dip down below freezing. We then go from Thursday, excuse me, into the day on Thursday and then watch the temperatures moderate as we go into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Now you notice during this whole time period, the East Coast and the West Coast were very, very hot. And remember, on Sunday, much of California breaking all-time records for heat. So it's going to be hot there for the remainder of this week as well. The snowfall forecast will be very challenging. This is the probability of getting at least four inches of snow from the Hydrologic Prediction Center. I think the most challenging area will be to forecast right in through here. We can take a look at what the National Digital Forecast Database says on this, and you see that they also pick out an area in through here where there might possibly be a few inches of snow. What will be challenging will be to pick up on the precipitation type. Now certainly as the flow goes over the front range, this is going to be snow, especially just barely above you know, the, the, the front range elevation there. You're going to start to see quite a bit of snow. But this area right in through here, remember we're seeing smoke yesterday, temperatures rapidly plummeting Tuesday into Wednesday, and then the possibility of snow. What a wild ride Colorado is going to be on this week. Okay, over the next three days, this is where the Europeans showed its greatest success last week. It was calling for that area to be dry as the wave cut off and then moved slowly here toward the Great Lakes. We could get heavy rainfall in parts of Texas, of course, but it will likely stretch here all across this region where the potential exists for getting anywhere between three quarters of an inch to upwards of two inches of rainfall over the next three days. Now take a look at what the GFS model says. It also now has that broad area in through here where that frontal boundary will sit as having the best probability of having the heavier rainfall. But notice the GFS is now in better agreement about this region and it's going to be dry. Storms over the southeast, you can also see that as well. From there, look at how long it takes from Wednesday night to Saturday morning for the trough to move from basically Utah to the border of Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. Therefore, during that time period, we're going to see from the GFS this area. Now, this is Wednesday through Sunday, okay? We're going to see this area continuing to get more precipitation. So I showed you the first three days. This is now the following five days. So right into this area, heavy rainfall. It's showing up in both models very clearly here. Now, if you're to the south of this, right into this area, there's a chance that we don't get anything out of this at all. So this is the problem with a cutoff low focusing its rainfall in this area. But keep an eye down here in the southeast for some stronger storms as well. From there, let's just give you a quick snapshot. This is your next seven days precipitation anomaly. Pause the video. Take a closer look. Europeans on the right. GFS is over here on the left. Just wanted to include this uh, in in this presentation. Okay, from there, day 10. The most critical piece, I think, of this flow is what's going on here with this Aleutian uh, Island trough. It will be reinforced by the two typhoons. Remember, we were talking about them last week. They are going to be coming up. They did come up through this area, and they're going to help reinforce this trough, which means the flow is going to continue to stay split across the west, and more often than not, some sort of trough in the eastern part of the U.S. and Canada. The difference will be where this trough sets up for week two, because right now it's pretty far to the east. You can see it in the GFS model as well. And because it's so far to the east, our week two precipitation patterns are drier across much of the United States. Remember, we're going to be in the convergent part of that upper level flow pattern. And as a result, it's going to be drier as we go out into week two. So this is what we've got now for week two from the GFS on the left and the European on the right. From there, let's talk temperatures. In the six to 10 day outlook, as that trough develops, we do see the cooler bias hanging on across a broad sector here of the United States. We're only warm in the southeast and partially up the east coast, and then of course out in the west. Both the GFS and the European in good agreement through day 10. As we step out here at longer term, we start to see the models both bringing in warmer air farther uh, into the central part of the United States and pushing the cooler weather to the east with the trough. I think what will 
what will really be the most important factor to see whether this happens is if the Aleutian low is reinforced. So we're going to watch model trends early this week on that uh, next 10 to 15 day time period here, but it could be relaxing and warming up for the end of the month of September. From there, we do have to discuss what's going on in the tropics because we watched over the weekend two large waves move off of Africa. This one here is now Tropical Depression 17 and the wave behind it has a 70 to 90 percent chance of continuing to form. The National Hurricane Center, of course, will be watching all of that throughout this week, including a low probability of some tropical development here just off the coast. At this particular point, they've given it a 10% chance of developing. From there, though, I do want to show you where 17 is forecast to go. Now, much of the model spread into this area is curling this system around the subtropical high, which will be sitting in this vicinity. As long as that high is sitting here and is relatively strong, the likelihood of 17 hitting the east coast is relatively small. But we need to watch where 17 goes and how it develops in the position of this ridge to know whether or not the east coast is kind of in the threat of, of uh, tropical depression 17. Remember, by the end of this week, we will have reached the peak of the hurricane season. We still have the second half of it to go. What will influence the second half of it? Well, the very warm ocean waters here and the fact that this La Nina is growing in strength. We are now well below our threshold of negative 0.5 degrees Celsius for the ocean temperatures in the Central Pacific. It's now down to negative 0.7. And you can see robust trade winds over the next 15 days, keeping the Southern Oscillation Index well above 7. So this means that our La Nina, which is in place, will likely continue to strengthen throughout the remainder of summer and fall. And as we look out to October, November, December, the latest updates from the Long Range European are keeping that La Nina around for our fall and early winter, in fact, strengthening it as of late, which will be critical for understanding our precipitation patterns in South America and also what to expect in terms of fall weather and winter weather here in North America. Now, later this week, I'll be discussing all of this in my long range outlook. But at this particular point, you can see that the models are favoring here in the eastern part of North America, a large ridge through the month of October. This is a much, much different look than we saw in October of 18 and October of 19. And why that's critical is for our harvest efforts that will be happening here across the country. This particular pattern is one that is going to favor more wetter conditions in the Northwest, but really throughout the midsection of the country, if we don't have any major landfalling tropical cyclones, it's drier. I'm going to discuss all of this in my long range update that'll come out on, on Wednesday. Until then, I hope you all have a great week and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Enjoy Labor Day and have a good week. Thank you.